can be seated. Wonderful. Just wonderful. If you're reading with us in the story, then you read this week about Ruth. Uh, if you didn't, let me give you a little summary. Uh, during the time of the judges in Canaan, there's this famine in the land, and so some of them looks like leave, like Elimelech. Elimelech is from uh, Bethlehem, and he and his wife Naomi and their two sons, and we don't really get to know them, but they go to Moab to get, rid of, get, get out of the dire circumstances to find food in Moab. So here in Moab they are, and about 10 years of living there, after his two sons marry Moabite women, the two sons are dead. So is dad. So now you have a family of three women. No men. There's just her, Naomi, the oldest, and her daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. Uh, little known fact that you may not care much about, but Oprah Winfrey is named after Orpah. Uh, somehow the pronunciation and spelling issues got in the way when she was younger, so Orpah becomes Oprah. But this one's name is Orpah. And Naomi hears about the Lord giving the people food again back in Canaan, and she decides they will go back. She will go home with her two daughters-in-law, but somewhere along the road, she decides to tell them. She stops them and says, no, 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 don't go with me. Go back home. Go back home, and she blesses them to leave her. Or Orpah heads back home. Ruth hangs on. And we come to this story, this, these words of the powerful commitment of Ruth to Naomi and her God. Part of this we already read, but listen to this if you haven't heard it before. Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. And your people will be my people. And your God, my God. And where you die, I'll die. And there I'll be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two ladies then head to Bethlehem, to the region of where she came from. They, they get there, Ruth is in tow, and Ruth may sound fully committed to Naomi, but it almost sounds like Naomi is losing her faith in God. Maybe that's too strong, but listen to what she says of God. He has made my life bitter. I went away full and he brought me back empty. He has afflicted me. He has brought misfortune upon me. It's not so much that she doesn't believe in God. She just doesn't like the way he's been treating her. Honest and raw. Well, it's harvest time. The barley is coming in. The two ladies want to eat. So chapter 2, Naomi has this relative named Boaz. He doesn't know it yet. He's a good man, a man of influence, a man of means. And when Ruth goes out, she picks a field that happens to belong to Boaz. So she starts collecting grain. What are the chances of that? Boaz finds out who this woman is, treats her with great respect, very kind to her, finds out he's the kinsman redeemer, decides he'd like to marry her, but there's a strange Israelite law that makes it sound like, and it is true, the, the, uh, the relative who's closest to her, the man should take her on as a wife. So, chapter 3, Naomi pulls a mother-in-law routine, gets into Ruth's business, they start making plans together. Uh, she tells Ruth, you get prettied up, go where Boaz is working. Uh, they, they, they start taking, getting to know each other in this uh, odd moment in a, while, while Boaz is sleeping. And his stomach is full. He's lying down and she says, uncover his feet, curl up there. He'll notice you and tell you what to do. Now, some scholars have said, if you read that section and said, what is going on here? I'm not sure either. Some have suggested there may be some sexual innuendo going on. Uh, I want to assume they're innocent. Frazee says her behavior is respectful, nonverbal. It's a conveying of the ability or availability and interest in marriage and I agree with that. So Boaz is startled in the night. He wakes up to find a woman at his bed at his feet and if you're a single guy you go to sleep alone and wake up with a beautiful woman at your feet you would be startled too. Boaz treats her very well. This kinsman redeemer thing comes into play. He wants to marry her, but he can't. So chapter 4 goes before the elders at the city gate, does what he must do to get Ruth, uh, goes home with one less sandal, odd again, but with a new wife coming to be his, marries Ruth. They get together, have a son named Obed. Boaz is thrilled. Ruth is more than a mother. Naomi is given a reason to celebrate, and that's the end of the story. Now, 
you read the story, and you may be tempted during the story, because I, I just want to point out a couple things. You may be tempted to say, well, didn't fate deal Naomi and Ruth a really bad hand? And, and wasn't it lucky how they eventually made it? And, and when they weren't given half a chance. And I've said these things before, but listen, listen. There is no fate. There is God. And there is no luck. There is God. And there is no chance. There is God. And we believe that here. So I can't answer all of the questions that you might have about the randomness of life. I see it too, and I wonder about it. I just think God is there, even when it seems to be random. And when the rest of the story is told, even into eternity, it won't seem so random after all. Proverbs 16.33 says, A lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Or as the Living Bible says it, we toss the coin, but it is the Lord who determines the decision. Now, that all sounds well and good when you just hit the lottery, but not so good when you just lost your job. Sounds great when you say, I do, not so good when you hear divorce. May be easy when your ship comes in, not so much when you're lost at sea. And seems very, very sweet when you gaze into the eyes of a newborn baby. Not so nice when you're laying your loved one into the casket. The wise preacher in Ecclesiastes 7 said, When times are good, be happy. When times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. God is working. We don't always like it as Naomi complained, but we know it and we believe it. God is working when times are good and God is working when times are bad. And God is even working in the in-between times. As James Dobson said, with God, even when nothing is happening, something is happening. There's another thing if you are reading Ruth along with us. There's this part of human nature that is tempted to just give up. Naomi looks like she's almost ready to give up. Orpah, looks like, decides to give up and just go home. My encouragement, if you are faced with this decision of should I go on or give up, don't give up. Read this story again. You want some encouragement? Read it. And don't quit reading it in the middle of the story. Even in the first chapter, if you left it, the story of Ruth, as God seems to be putting them on their backside, they're laying down saying, I give. Naomi is crying, Uncle. If you walk away and quit reading, when they're at their lowest, you have missed God's working redemptively in the story to finish it. They're just getting started. And thankfully, Naomi doesn't really give up, and Ruth doesn't even give up, and God blesses both of them. So just another Moabite widow becomes an honored wife, an expectant mother. She's not just any other mother either. She brings a child into this world that's not just any child. This one is destined for greatness because he will be the father of Jesse, the grandfather of David, the great king of Israel. It's not the greatest part of the story, though, because there's more coming. There's one greater than David that's coming. Do you know that story? That's still a long way from the end of the story. This part isn't included in this story, but the rest of it makes this part seem almost insignificant. This woman named Ruth... She's not just the title of the book that we just read. Her name is in an elite list of great names, one among three women listed in Matthew 1, the genealogy of Jesus. So Ruth just has a baby, who just has a baby, who just has a baby, and pretty soon there's a manger in Bethlehem holding the one who would save the world. Jesus comes through Ruth. And the narrator of the story doesn't even know the rest of the story. Obed is born, but that's not the rest of the story. The greater secret was not even known in those days that the Messiah was coming. God knows today something of our future, and I can't even tell you what that is, but don't give up. God knows, God acts, God works to bring it to completion. And we focus on the story of Ruth, and that's right to do. It's even called Ruth. But don't forget Naomi. I wonder if one of those funerals, one of the three where she buries her husband and her son and her son, if one of those, if she ever asked herself, could I ever be happy again? But she does become happy again. I wonder if she asked, how in the world could God bring joy out of misery? But he does. What a feeling that must have been at the end when Naomi finally brings that little boy up into her arms. That smile must have been hard to wipe off her face. The son, if not hers, but her daughter-in-law, actually becomes more like her son. 
And for you in the moment of sorrow when you ask, can God do anything here? Just wait. Just wait. God is still working. Don't give up on Him. Don't you dare give up on Him. He takes this bitter old Israelite woman who's empty and fills her up. Takes a probably good, decent, kind bachelor and brings in the wife of his dreams from an exotic land. Takes a widowed foreigner from Moab and brings her to Israel where she becomes the great grandma to Israel's greatest king. And the ragtag group of nobodies becomes somebody special who becomes somebody special who becomes somebody special. And pretty soon, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and Savior of all is born in a manger in Bethlehem. Don't leave the story too soon. Don't quit reading. Don't quit hoping. Don't wait too long or keep waiting longer. Sorry. If you walked across the tragedy and you stopped right there and just shed a tear for Ruth and Naomi, you would have missed the witness to the victory of God. Which reminds us of another story if you haven't heard this one. As a almost naked and possibly fully naked, bruised and bleeding son of God hangs on a cross just outside of a powerful city called Jerusalem. And it looks like it's over. How could God bring anything good out of this? What is going to happen now? This is the worst day ever, as my kids like to say. Is there a tomorrow when death leaves misery and suffering and heartache and pain? Sin and Satan on that day had their day. Death and the grave held him there. Would not let him go until one word changed everything. It happened on a Sunday morning. The word is resurrection. And it changed everything. That's why we're here. It's why we celebrate. It's why we hope for tomorrow and the tomorrow beyond the grave. So I'm not done yet, but could I just see, ask without you answering, but just answer it to yourself? What kind of a person are you? What kind of a person are you? Maybe you find yourself in the, self in the story of Ruth. Can I tell you about you without even knowing you? Because you are probably a lot like me. There is hope only found in the Lord. Your hope is only found in the Lord. There is only hope through Jesus Christ. And the absolute truth is, I am lost without the saving blood of Jesus. And I don't know if you want to hear it or not, but you are too. If your faith has never led you to repent of your sins and be buried with Christ in baptism, do it today. And if your faith has left God out of the story, then time to change the story. Because God has given His Son as a gift. And God has given the offer of salvation. Don't reject it. Don't give up on the story right now in the middle of the story. you got more to live and more to do. What kind of story are you living today? Have you determined it can't get any worse? Tragedy has struck you and it is bad and you are at your lowest. Don't give up. Maybe some would like to call into question God Himself. But let me tell you about God Himself. He's faithful. And I won't make light of your situation because it may be bad. But don't give up on God. At life's worst, He is at His best. Trust in the Lord who works, who acts, who orchestrates life, bringing meaningless to meaningful, from outcast to royalty, from sinner to saved, just like my story. Make a commitment, not to some random person or a near relative, make it to the Lord. Where you go, I will go, and even to your death. And when we stand and sing later, not yet, you want to give your life to Christ, do it. Change from your old evil ways, do it. Be immersed in water, do it. Be covered in blood, saved and redeemed and forgiven to have the Spirit of God and hope for tomorrow, do it. But I'm not done yet. Today, maybe you feel like Ruth on the outside. I, I don't know you, and if you're a guest of ours and I may not know where you've been, Maybe you're in a church of all places and you even here don't feel in, like you're, you feel like you're out of place maybe. Maybe you don't have faith. Maybe you had it but you lost it. Maybe you took it but you let it down and you walked away from it. I'm glad you're here. Maybe you're wondering what all this is about. But if you feel like an outcast, a foreigner, like you don't really understand this feeling of faith or the language of church or the traditions of God and His people, this is just weird, you're in good company. 
I think Ruth would have understood that very well. So don't give up. Stick around. Don't leave frustrated. Hang on. Pay attention. Stick close to somebody else, even if their faith leads you to God. Follow right in the steps of others who are walking in that direction because the blessing is still coming. God's working. He takes an outsider, an unbeliever, and puts her right in the heart of the story to bless the whole world. Today, maybe you aren't here to honor God because you're mad at God for what He's done. Maybe you're like Naomi and you could repeat these words, He's made my life bitter. Why would I honor God? I'm empty. He afflicted me. He's brought me misfortune. That's all I know now. Still, please, don't give up on God. Recognize where you are, even if it's in a very bad place. Lay it at His feet, but don't give up on the story too soon. The end of the story is just amazing whether you can believe it or not. Now before we're done, let me just say something to all of you. Whether you're a first-time guest or a long-time Christian, if you're going to follow the Lord, then follow Ruth's example. And the words used sometimes to describe it, many people would say it, it's follow Him with reckless abandon. Before Jonna and I got married, she recommended a book that I read. It's out of print, but I highly recommend it. I've talked about it before if you've been here since the beginning. And especially if you're single and kind of wondering if uh, God can do something great in your life and bring you happiness. The book is called Lady in Waiting. And in it, the authors say, In the book of Ruth, a young widow made a critical decision to turn her back on her people, her country, and her gods because her thirsty soul had tasted of the God of Israel. And with just a taste, she recklessly abandoned herself to the only true God. What would you do to follow the Lord? What are you willing to give up? What really matters in this life? And what would you exchange to get it, whatever it is? Have you asked yourself those questions? Jesus asked his own question. What would you give in exchange for your soul? What if you gained the whole world let, yet lost your own soul? I don't even know what you think of yourself, but the Lord thinks you are worth everything because God gave His everything to save you. You were bought, whether you know it or not, with precious blood. So live your life for the Lord. Lose your life to find it. Follow Him no matter the cost. With reckless abandon, follow Him. It is worth it all. Elizabeth Elliot wrote this book, Through Gates of Splendor. It's a powerful book. I have one desire now, she wrote. I have one desire now to live a life of reckless abandon for the Lord, putting all my energy and strength into it. And that sounds like just a beautiful quote from a beautiful lady who said it so well using beautiful words. Maybe easy to say when you're sitting in church, harder to say or live as Elizabeth did knowing that her husband and his missionary friends were killed by the Aka Indians in Ecuador 1956. The, the very Indian people, the natives, they went to give the gospel of Jesus Christ to so they could be saved. And as they pulled their spear-pierced bodies from the river, it had to be hard to believe that God is worthy of following and the sacrifice is worth it. Those ladies did it. Those wives believed it. So much so that some of them stayed and some of those same Indians who killed their husbands came to faith in Jesus. I just hope we would all say it and believe it. And may we live lives of reckless abandon, fully committed to following the Lord no matter the cost. Where you go, I will go. Let's stand and sing. Come if you need to. Mm -hmm.